Creative Placemaking. My name is Andrea Orlando and I'm community director here. And we started this series as a way to connect people during quarantine. Um, and since we can't get together in person for a cup of coffee or a meal, um, I, thought, I thought it would be nice for everybody to start by, if you're on video, please raise your mug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or container. And <laughs> we will officially get this conversation underway. So the person who's been greeting you is Meg Sertigliano. She is Burning Man cultural ambassador and founder of Globally Curated. And I'm going to share my screen so that she can um, read you a couple of ground rules to help us all have the best possible experience. And you got it. Yeah. So, hey everyone, it's been such an honor to get to work with Andrea and Leo and Christine and the team. Been having a lot of fun getting to know creative placemakers. Um, it's just a really nice community to participate in. So, um, just for today to set us up for success, um, I see you're already doing that, but continue uh -huh. to introduce yourself in the chat and where you're calling in from. Um, see you Saturday. Um, and then we're going to record this. In fact, I'm going to hit record now. Um, if you, and really what we do is use this for podcasts and um, potentially to send out to folks internal to the network. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, just simply um, turn off your video. There's a, in the left-hand corner at the bottom, it says stop video. Um, so for now, I'm going to hit record. All right, folks see the red light? Did it work? Yeah, maybe. Let's make sure. I think yeah, we're- It's because I'm recording as well, so at least we have a redundant back up there. <laughs> I'm oh, recording hi. also. <laughs> oh, well then, mm -hmm. the, apart the Department of Redundancy Department will continue <laughs> ground rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, mute yourself uh, when the folks are chatting so that you, um, yeah, so we don't hear your background noise. Um, listen generously. There's some really amazing folks who have done a lot of incredible work. Um, so let's let's be present and open um, to hearing their perspectives. Um, and then feel free, of course, to share any resources that may be pertinent to the conversation or to the group here in the chat. Um, and we will um, reshare those in our follow up. So without further ado, back over to you, Andrea, to introduce our fabulous guest for today. Okay, so today we have RJ Thompson and Kent Kerr. Um, Kent is going to share his screen. And um, so RJ is Associate Director of Student Engagement at the University of Pittsburgh College of Business Administration. He, he won the Ohio Governor's Award in the Arts and Community Development from the Ohio Arts Council in, last year for a project in Youngstown, Ohio called City of You. And Kent Kerr is an MFA candidate at Radford University and he's just finishing up his thesis, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, both RJ and Kent are principals at Plus Public, a community communications research and design firm based in Bellevue, oh. Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. And they say that they work like the fictitious detective team, Sherlock Holmes and his sidekick, Dr. Watson, <laughs> and they alternate roles. So they're not always one thing and the other, but they're, they're always the opposing characters. So, uh, so I have a couple of questions for Kent. Um, I actually read half of your thesis and um, yeah, with great interest. And, you know, before we get into it, I was just wondering if we could ground ourselves in um, what do you mean when you say design thinking? What is design thinking? How is it different from other kinds of thinking? 
Sure, and I'll start screen, uh, screen sharing to help me answer that question. So traditional thinking, as it were, typically presumes or assumes a question, uh, implements a process that will give you a definitive answer. So two plus two equals four, you assume the question, the process, and the answer. So it's linear, question-driven, and answer-focused. Uh, design thinking is human-centric and uh, process-based, so it's non-linear. Uh, whenever you're dealing with more complex issues, you implement a custom methodology. So how you approach the, the uh, question can change. Um, again, human-centric, there has to be a human element. So you're solving for people. and. Uh, I'm gonna use solution-based instead of answer-based because the process can start with an answer in order to find a question. So you'll see the little arrows here um, create a non-directional circle. So we can start by making something if the question might be, uh, let's say you're an engineer and you have a product and you want to, how do people interact with my product? You would put the product in their hands and observe them. So that's, that's sort of the crux of design thinking. Mm -hmm. And so you did your research in Bellevue. Um, could one of you set the stage for us? Tell us a little bit about Bellevue. Yeah, That's so, RJ's town. Yeah, so I, I'm a Bellevue resident and our business is uh, formalized in, in Bellevue. Um, so Bellevue is about, it, it's uh, the first borough outside of the city of Pittsburgh limits uh, to the north. About one square mile, uh, roughly 8,000 people. Um, in in two, 2015, it started to experience uh, an economic renaissance with respect to new businesses opening up, new restaurants. Um, prohibition was lifted in 2015. So that's one of the unique characteristics of our borough. Uh, so as soon as that was lifted, then businesses started coming in. Uh, people were investing in our community, even residents like our friend John that's on this call. He and, he and his partner invested their time, money, and resources into rehabilitating properties and converting them into new uses. Um, and additionally, there is a uh, large and growing population of young people moving into the borough and giving it a really sort of uh, revitalization, not just in terms of businesses and community development, but just culture. Um, so we felt that Bellevue would be a very amenable place to conduct our research. Uh, we knew that with uh, the combination of the Community Development Corporation called Bonafide Bellevue. Uh, we would have the potential to implement any work that, that we could complete, any research, and um, we've been fortunate in that they've been very supportive and are essentially co-opting this research for their economic and community development uh, needs. So, um, overall, the composition of, of Bellevue, it, it kind of ranges from low to high, um, you know, uh, in terms of what your place is within the economy. Um, and there's a growing diverse population. Um, about 28% of our population comes from diverse or minoritized backgrounds, and we're seeing that increase. So Bellevue, for what we're trying to do, is kind of just like this great community that has all of the characteristics and things that we're looking for that will supercharge uh, this research. Mm -hmm. and, and how big is it? What is the population? It's about 8,000. Mm -hmm. within one square mile so it's a really packed <laughs> community uh, mm -hmm. yeah and and can you place it geographically for us uh sure yeah oh so, i think you did that just north yeah. of pittsburgh right yeah it's about yeah. if not even five miles away from downtown pittsburgh yeah yeah and so this research was about um help finding a community identity through design thinking. And so what I'd like to know is yes. what, it, what is community identity and, and how would that be different from community branding and why would it be important? Yeah, so community branding kind of assumes a product. 
uh, a logo, a signage, sort of a shared, uh, I, short visual image of oneself. A community identity is more of a shared public perception. So it's sort of uh, what do you, what does the Bellevue citizen think of of themselves or their community when asked what is Bellevue all about or what does it mean to be a Bellevue resident? Um, so that would be their community identity, and ideally you would use that to build uh, an effective and well-supported brand. Mm -hmm. So, um, assuming a brand is what they need. Uh, so I do wanna say like, we use identity as sort of a springboard to that end, but you know, some of these communities have an identity and, and they just need more visibility. So we wanted to look at Bellevue as sort of a, a prototype, almost a microcosm of that sort of atypical just outside of the city suburb and uh, see how we could sort of use that as sort of a, an archetype to uh, influence other communities. And with the changes that have occurred since 2015, if you ask any given resident exactly what Bellevue is, you know, uh, it's going to range uh, across the whole spectrum. And um, especially as it relates to community and economic development, if there is a, uh, a consensus on who uh, or what a place is uh, conceptually, uh, ideologically, if, if you can nail that down, um, that's going to augment and support all of your other uh, efforts towards growth within the community. So uh, being able to do this research and really gain a comprehensive understanding of what Bellevue is to the people that make it what it is and how they live, work, play, learn, and ultimately thrive in this place. If we can access that, uh, we can ideally utilize that to uh, create sustaining efforts towards growth. And so the impetus behind the, the project, my research, was I gave you the definition of design thinking as I understand it. That's problem solving for people with the graphic. And community identity is a shared perception of a people. So the hypothesis was right there lies the parallel. So one can be used as a process to inform or find out the other. Mm -hmm. So if community is people and design thinking is problem solving for people, then design thinking is problem solving for community, community identity. Mm -hmm. Here's an example uh, to contextualize this. So one of the things, and, and we'll elaborate on this, uh, but one of the things that we discovered through our research is that there was a very clear uh, desire for public art in our community, which has none, no visible public art. So, you know, through this research, we've discovered that there's an interest. Uh, we discovered that also the community was willing to support it conceptually, but then they were also able to support it financially. So we put together a, uh, a mural program and we were able to raise $5,000 within two to three months time, which is very rapid for uh, a community that has our characteristics. So that is essentially a proof positive of the research. And um, we'll be starting those murals hopefully here in a few weeks, by the way. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, the, the research informs potential results. Um, so we just put it out there and we were able to get so much more in return. Yeah, and who contributed to, um, like who were the contributors? Were they also residents? Yeah, so we, um, people we tapped had to have sort of some kind of toe in Bellevue. Uh, they could be residents, they could be just working within the Bellevue limits, they could be transplants, they could be people who lived there previously. Uh, as long as they had some live, work, play, thrive aspect of Bellevue, then we, uh, considered their opinion and viewpoint valid for the research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, it sounds like you did a lot of the research through um, in-person interviews, one-on-one interviews. 
um, uh, one on one interviews and uh, focus groups, or we would call them uh, charrettes. Mm -hmm. um, design thinking workshops uh, basically get, and I do want to preface this since we do have Sabrina and, and RJ on here. Um, our initial pool that we tapped uh, did utilize Bonafide Bellevue's resources, resources because these are movers and shakers and people heavily involved. And we use that as an opportunity to branch out and find people who wouldn't otherwise be involved. So we tried to cast as wide as net as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm showing on the screen here is scenes from some of the focus groups and some of the uh, visuals and data that were generated by it um, for the purposes of anonymity, um, protecting identity. I, I'm not gonna list who we interviewed. Um, we didn't take pictures from that since that was more one-on-one, -on -one. but uh, we do have just a few choice slides here of some of the, the workshops that we run. Mm -hmm. um, and a question that's coming up in the chat, I'm capturing those um, questions as you send them in folks, mm -hmm. um, that I think just points back to, the, to what you were talking about related to the murals. Um, Annie's asking, can you talk about any local approving processes you have to go through before painting? Um, this is something that she's encountered a lot in prison and also in the university. So just curious um, what you had to work through for that. Um, yeah, great question. So uh, we've been quite fortunate uh, in that um, our, our data and research has supported uh, the mural project. Um, <laughs> essentially, we've given uh, some of the data points, uh, some of the testimonials to uh, the borough council, to the mayor, to zoning, um, and you know, just even some of those folks donated to this project. Uh, so ideologically, I think everyone's on board. Uh, my, we haven't really had any issues there at all. I think one of the bigger issues that we're facing in the context of your question is how do we create artwork that is received well by the public? Um, that I think is our biggest issue. So we want to be able to produce work that is not only uh, for the community, but also by the community. So we have some limitations there with respect to that. So if you're looking at the screen in the center panel, you'll see two designs. Those designs were created by Jenny Denton, uh, whom is a local illustrator and graphic designer. And these particular murals, I mean, they're not really offensive whatsoever. They sort of have a very, they're appealing, they have nice aesthetics, um, but more importantly, especially the top one, they're easy to make, at least in, in theory, right? Uh, we're using very flat colors, very basic shapes. We want to be able to essentially trace an outline on a building and then have members of our community actually paint this. So it's not like we're paying one artist to do it. No, if we could get a group of 30 people to paint, great. I want to be able to, and, and Kent as well, we want to be able to say, when you drive by that mural, that was a community effort. Those were community artists making that. And even if they aren't artists, right, they're a part of that collective now. And, you know, 20 years from now, we want those same people to say, yeah, I remember painting that and, and you know, having a hand in that. So the, the nice thing about this is that uh, because of the money that we fundraised, we're not only going to be able to produce those two murals, but we're also going to be able to produce more than those two murals. So our additional challenge is then, all right, how do we solicit more artwork and, you know, get community feedback and, and buy in on that. So on the technical level with zoning in, in the borough, we're not gonna have any issues whatsoever. Um, it's mostly uh, making sure that the community is fully on board. Mm -hmm. and just to make sure the community is involved, you're, these are, uh, were generated to get feedback. So you might be looking down in the lower right hand corner of each of these posters. Your feedback is appreciated. We had online polls and in, in person polling stations where they could offer their feedback. And that is right here in the upper right hand corner. That was set up at Bain Library for people who weren't uh, online or web savvy. 
they can go and, and write in and put their stuff in a suggestion box. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the, um, the process uh, by, by which you gathered the, the input helped you in any way uh, communicate with the public officials who would ultimately be approving the, the permits and I would say yes. It creates a level of transparency that just isn't there without it. Mm -hmm. um, not that we were, were operating under in the shadows, but that sort of just completely eliminates that that fear that we're trying to go under somebody's nose or or trip somebody up. It's just be involved, be honest, just be very clear with what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And we've received very little pushback. Yeah, we, no one benefits if we are, uh, if we're not fully transparent. Um, and taking that objective transparent route has actually helped us tremendously in progressing not only the research, but, you know, getting people to opt in to participating in, in our research. Uh, but additionally, uh, what's great about this is that all of the data that's generated justifies any creative decision making that uh, we may anticipate. So for example, you know, uh, if you look at the third panel, we're using a darker, you know, kind of burgundy red, right? Uh, that's actually the color of, of, that's one of the high school colors is that, that golden rod and, and burgundy color. Uh, if the community says, we want to see those colors and like it's 80% of the community that we pulled, then we're going to use those colors. So uh, this is very much a, uh, a des uh, design decisions informed by the community, made by the community. And then with Kent and I, with whatever we're doing, be it project management or actually creating the deliverables, you know, they utilize our creative experiences and capabilities as designers as a lens through which those decisions are channeled. Um, so on our end, we're able to satisfy any concerns regarding quality uh, and output and we're able to build with the community in mind. Um, yeah, they're the bosses. Mm -hmm. uh, this might be a question that you have coming up on the, uh, the tip of your tongue. This actually is, if you look right here, this is the methodology that we implemented in Bellevue. This is right here, third row, first, first item and the second item, which is a critique and creation cycle. So create something, get critique, feedback, revise the product. So everything above that uh, informed those, those solutions, the colors, um, the decisions that were made, all of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, Kent and RJ, a question that David had raised earlier that I think it's a nice time since we've got the model up here. Sure. Is, is design thinking um, compatible with theories of change and other logic models? Yeah, so I like to think so. The nice thing about design thinking from my experience is that it scales very well. Um, we have a couple techniques and I'll refer to one called laddering where it's effectively pulling the, mic, the uh, magnifying glass in or out based on need. So if you're looking at a very large systemic problem, that's almost impossible to solve. So you might have to pull into the individual elements that make up that system and solve them piece by piece. Or if you're just sort of dealing with a small little kind of niggling issue, you might wanna pull out and see the larger problem at hand and uh, try to just soften the overall effect that those little issues might have or see where a little problem like that can snowball into something larger. Um, I hope that doesn't sound like too much of a, a nonsense answer, but the design thinking is really about just changing how you see and how you think about the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One word that came up in, in, your, in your work was, uh, um wicked problems oh, what a wicked problems <laughs> yeah 
and and that's that's a glossary term you know that sure. uh, yeah that not every not everybody has heard but i think it applies you know yeah so for those of you who haven't heard it wicked problems is a is design thinking shop talk and it pretty much means very complex almost unsolvable problem um you've all heard of like alexander the great and the uh the gordian knot how do you solve it? Okay, that's basically what a wicked problem is. So how do you unpick this very complex knot? Do you brute force it? Do you pick it apart strand by strand? Um, ideally, you would run enough research and methodology to sort of pick the best solution and uh, make some progress. So I, I do think it's important to point out that design thinking, no problem that we approach would we ever say we're gonna come up with the solution because mm -hmm. it's normally not going to happen. You're going to find the best solution for now mm -hmm. with the understanding that it could change tomorrow or a better solution could change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so. so if you're a completionist or perfectionist, the design thinking might get a little frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's your wicked problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. posts, but uh, I wanted to address David's question. Um, we, uh, regarding a public space in Bellevue, so oh, yeah. um, we have, we don't really have a, a square. Um, we actually, <laughs> we basically have uh, a, a church that's in the center of our business district, and it's aptly named the center of Bellevue. Uh, that would essentially be the equivalent of our community square, um, that it's right in the heart of our community, um, and outside of that, the other sort of community square is our library, which hosts our farmer's market. Uh, there is an absolutely massive playground and skate park there. Um, and really the, the library is, is the true center of, of Bellevue as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, so we co-opt different things for our community square. Yeah, so on that note, every bit of research that we did, we wanted to do it in a public and sort of neutral place. So the Bellevue, the square, uh, the center of Bellevue, um, uh, muddy cup coffee shop for like personal interviews, just something that where people could feel very comfortable. Um, and there's no like, uh, su such and such owns this, so there's biases or, or anything like that. We didn't want to trap anybody. Mm -hmm. um, there's a library if you're curious. <laughs> Were you lucky enough to finish that aspect of the research before quarantine? Yes, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> right before it. I mean, it was like two weeks before quarantine. I, I uh, knocked this out. So, um, Not that we couldn't do it online, but there is certainly something to be said about having people in the room. So, Yeah. So, uh, another thing that, that has come up uh, with relation to our work is the uh, repeatability or our ability to replicate this model in other communities. Um, and speaking to the scalability of, of our, our research model, uh, you know, we fit it to the characteristics or the profile of Bellevue. And it can expand or contract depending on the, the population density of all of these other communities. One thing that's interesting about Bellevue is it is the first borough on Route 65, which is a 50 mile stretch of road, uh, one of the main arteries out of Pittsburgh. It's the first borough you encounter outside of the city limits. And then that, that route goes all the way up through Beaver County. Uh, there are probably over 40, 45 different communities on this, on this road. Uh, and what's cool about this is we can take this model and see the good work that it's done for Bellevue and then go to Avalon and then go mm -hmm. to Ben Avon and Emsworth and mm -hmm. Maysville and Swickley and just keep hitting every single town. So, you know, when you apply some moonshot thinking, what does a region at this point look like? Maybe it's a micro region, but what does a micro region look like at this point that's had this work done? Uh, in succession. So 50 communities that apply this type of research, like I feel like there could be a lot of great 
and very coordinated and strategic prosperity that can result. So that's one thing that we're kind of thinking about long term. What does that look like? And how can all of these communities flex their creative muscles if that is what the, these communities deem that they need on a 50 mile stretch? Um, that would be a hell of a bike tour. You know, uh, and so when you think about community engagement, economic development, you start in Bellevue, where it all started, and then you go all the way up through Beaver County. Uh, in a given day, you're going to see some ideally incredible things, but that's also an idealistic goal. Mm -hmm. So, like on that point, with uh, what you're seeing here is the sign on 65, and part of the research. Um, was all about needing transparency because a lot of people thought that this was Bellevue with just these gas stations and fast food restaurants, but Bellevue proper doesn't start until you get up on the hill. So, um, so that was a, a little interesting bit of data to come out of the research. Have, have you heard from those, some of those other communities along Route 65? Are they contacting you and, and asking questions? So we've done some uh, preliminary talks. Yeah, yeah, there, there's some preliminary conversations that were initially, uh, you know, inspired by the local council of governments. Uh, basically, uh, the Quaker Valley Council of Governments received a uh, Department of Transportation grant from the state uh, to conduct a uh, transportation study on Route 65. And a, an aspect of that is creative placemaking. More importantly, how can creative placemaking be used to uh, introduce elements of, of safety, but also recreation? Um, and our research uh, is attempting to, we're, we're sort of attempting to take what we can of our research and apply it to that context, but really to, to get at the, the heart of those questions, essentially to solve those wicked problems, we have to apply this, we would have to apply this model to all of those communities for as long of a stretch is being researched. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Working with government's a slow burn, but hopefully we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Do the two of you have any questions for the people on this call for the creative placemaking community? Is there any feedback that you'd, you'd be interested in, in hearing? Well, I mean, I would, I would say up front, uh, any, any and all feedback you have for us, we will happily accept um, any opportunities for us to share our resources or uh, collaborate. You know, we're fully, we're, we're fully on on board with. Um, we've found that this model has helped us introduce new concepts to this community and by how we are uh, executing on this model those concepts are easy easily and uh, easily acceptable let's put it that way. So our barrier for entry is is significantly lower. I mean, if you try to uh, if you attempt a creative placemaking project in conceivably any community, you have to have an awareness of all of the things that that project would uh, affect. Uh, especially, you need to to have an understanding of the systems of government and zoning. And um, we found that through this model, being able to drop a barrier for entry. We have people that work in these areas that specialize in them that are willing to help us uh, solve them quickly. Uh, and yeah, so to that point, uh, I want to draw everybody's attention to um, the lower left and the middle one here. Uh, this is all data points that participants put up, so different colors, different uh, voting topics, different uh, points on the bullseye here. And the one thing you want to notice after it's all said and done is there's no names, there's no uh, identities. You know, we've had creatives in here. Um, uh, super, well, the superintendent for the North Gate School came. So, but through the, through the uh, context, through the lens of these exercises, it gives everybody sort of an equal footing. So, all that data is counted equally after the fact. Um, and this, isn't, this is only fun to look at because it's just a wall of information. I said I wouldn't comment on the re, uh, interviewers, but that's the interview data. So that's all individual like points of 
interest that I pulled out of all these interviews. <laughs> um, and then I broke all of that down into sort of thematic points and it simplified into that. Yeah, we, we've got a roadmap for what can come next. Uh, you know, yeah. Ken identified through his re research three primary areas of need that were, you know, in the majority relative to uh, our participants' interest areas. So, you know, need for code enforcement, need for public art, and a need for marketing savvy to be applied to the community that increases our travel and tourism uh, and economic development means. Uh, and those were all democratized, so yeah. it wasn't the loudest person in the room got the, got the poster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Andrea, coming back to your question, I think one of the things that that we would kindly ask of those in attendance or even the, the creative placemaking community in large is help us make this work better so that we can democratize our model and share it with our colleagues and ideally help their work, you know, manifest more easily, quickly, and certainly more informed. Um, and a question that came up in the chat a little earlier, this feels like a nice time to ask you, um, is from Stephanie. How did you raise the money to support this work? And, and how did you um, make the ask to, to undertake this? Is she yeah. talking about the research or just the murals? The murals. The murals. Oh, if it's the murals, then I'll let yeah. RJ take it. So um, we used IOBI. Um, as our platform for uh, donations. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to be a part of a matching grant. Um, our initial baseline uh, ask was $2,000. And we primarily generated that through social media and word of mouth. Uh, in specific, there was uh, one caveat to our fundraising that I think appealed to a lot of people. Um, and this is where we kind of deviated from most fundraising platforms. We, um, we knew that there were more people in Bellevue that had $10 than $100. So we figured if we can get a lot of people to donate $10, uh, that would improve our chances of fulfilling our goal. Uh, so at the, at, let's say the $200 level, you got everything that we would, you know, we guaranteed. So you would get little prints of the of the murals, you would get a PDF and all these other things. You would get your name on the mural. That was a big deal for a lot of people. But at the $10 level, uh, and you could only get this at the $10 level, I guarantee that I will sing an improvised and totally made up song about Bellevue in front of your house. Um, and I might pull some of the project partners in to sing that along with me, not in like a barbershop, barbershop quartet situation, but uh, just in, in, in general, just, it will just make up a song. And so that went heard, over really, really well. So if you haven't heard of IOBE, <laughs> there's different tiers of donation, think Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, and in regards to RJ singing, you're looking at this alpha extrovert. So he will absolutely do this. <laughs> So. <laughs> have you done it yet, RJ? Not yet. I have to get over my performance anxiety with singing because my brothers got the music genes. I did not. <laughs> you, by the way, um, and, and this wasn't planned, okay, but we, Iobi, the folks from Iobi are our next guests. Awesome. At the coffee talk in two weeks. And they're going to be highlighting some other projects in Detroit and New Orleans. So um, that was totally unplanned. Cool. <laughs> yeah, Iobi has been great to work with. Uh, and we'll, we're actually, uh, I think we're working with them again uh, relatively soon on a similar uh, but unrelated project uh, related to our farmer's market. Mm -hmm. In Bellevue or, or elsewhere? In Bellevue, yep. Um, a question from Alexandra Duncan. 
how receptive and willing were individuals um, from Bellevue um, to be a part of this project, particularly with communities who are disinvested there um, and there needs to be a kind of trust established with local community partners. So how did you engage them? And what was that, what was that like? Yeah, that's interesting because a part of the thesis study was um, using design thinking as a means observing its potential impact on uh, community disassociation and community uh, identity decline, we call it. Uh, people that have become so disinvested that they sort of are out of touch by, we'll say, the community today as it was whenever they were last involved. Um, we had some apprehension, but not nearly as much as I would have thought. Uh, once people were there and in the seats and surrounded by their uh, their peers, uh, everybody was pretty pretty mellow. The only thing I would say that maybe caused, ruffled uh, bristled a little hairs was um, having to get people to sign consent forms just by <laughs> yeah. virtue of the research. That didn't go over great. Um, but uh, if we were doing this just on our own and that wasn't a factor, I think there would be very little apprehension at all. Mm -hmm. So those, content, those uh, consent forms can be a beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Hmm. Sorry, so I can't there's see another the question here from, from Stephanie. Uh, uh, it's curious about how you match the needs and interests of the community with the type of art you chose and the artists you chose and were those local or imported? And did, yeah, and did the artists hold a, a public process with the community? So uh, with regard to that, uh, we, we're leading with our, our ethics here. Uh, we wanted to hire a local artist and for any subsequent murals, we want to hire local artists. We want to pay those artists. It's incredibly important to Kent and I as professional artists that the artists that we hire to do this work are paid for it. Um, so Jenny uh, not only agreed to do this work, but she also agreed to let us pay her to do it, even though she would have done it for free. Um, we felt that her particular style that you see on your screen now um, was uh, very uh, adaptable for different contexts, different contours of walls, um, but it was also uh, very adaptable to the, to the to our community wanting to actually participate in the creation of this work. So, um, you know, her work was just perfect across the board for our purposes. Um, as part of our outreach, you know, we basically made a decision and more importantly, the owners of the properties, John and, and our colleague Scott and Chris, they decided, you know, what kind of aesthetics they would be amenable to. And it just all just perfectly lined up. It was really serendipity. Uh, any murals beyond this point, ideally we would open up to a public voting process. Now we know that, that voting in that context can get really hairy, um, but if you simplify it, you take out any kind of opportunity to sort of, you know. So dissent. So dissent, if it's option A, B, or C, and then the community votes, then great. The thing is though, we have so much money that we fundraise for this, that if we put a poll out for, uh, for a third mural, and with that third mural, there are three options, we can still make those three options. So we're, we've really just got a, a really just, again, just amazing opportunity to just produce the work. So, you know, we're in this point where it's like, well, do we actually do a poll? What will be the interest? You know, the other thing is we don't want artists to produce spec work beyond a certain point. So if we solicit a, a call for proposals, you know, we're not exactly asking them to produce artwork. Like, tell us what you want to make and then let's talk about what that looks like and how it can be made. Mm -hmm. So treading very, very carefully on speculative work. Uh, in the design industry, it's a sin, and I would never uh, ask a, a designer to do spec work, uh, especially for something so highly visible. Mm 
Yeah, we kind of have this thing against design competitions. <laughs> mm. So kind of, we, we feel like kind of devalues the work, devalues people's talents, but I'm not saying what we think is right, but that's just where we stand on the matter. <laughs> Well, I can tell you right now that especially because of uh, the pandemic, like artists are suffering hardcore right now. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's our pleasure to be able to, to offer that what we can. Yeah. And uh, with that, I, I wonder if um, we're starting to come up on the hour and I wonder if you have a couple of key you know, takeaways that you want to communicate, um, like what have you learned and what would you advise the rest of us to attempting this work? I'll defer to Ken. Um, well, I would say first and foremost, I learned that I already have changes I want to make to this methodology and I fully expect that it wouldn't translate one-to-one -to, -one to another community. Um, every community is different, everybody's people are, are different, and you need to sort of customize that to fit that community. Um, don't go in there with the attitude or the assumption that you're going, that you know the problem and that you're going to immediately solve it. You will be very disappointed. So, um, that would be my, my big takeaway. Um, and I would say engagement kind of breeds ownership, which fosters pride. Um, a lot of people involved in this, we kept getting emails just when they could read it, when they could see it, when would it be done? And that was even without knowing the larger context of it or what, what we'd written about. So it was just interesting that when people get involved, they're it fosters a deeper interest. So it kind of just reinforces the idea that um, just being involved and giving people a voice makes people invested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think one of the things that I like about our process is how human centered it is, not just on uh, the participant level, but also on the administrator level. Um, you know, our, conceivably the, the model that we have here can be applied and replicated anywhere by anyone. So I think for me, one of the big things that, that I think would be a, a celebration of Kent's research and our work in this community is to perpetuate it and, and repeat it and try to make this model as simple and as clear and as intuitive and organic as possible. Because I think that every single community that we've experienced, be, if their population's five or five million, amazing work can be done by anybody. And I really hope that this process eventually shows that when you bring people together under a very specific process that is respectful and constructive, amazing things can happen. And you don't have to be an artist or a designer or a researcher uh, to make big things happen. Yeah, yeah, this, this feels like um, when it's published, it's gonna be a gift to the, the community. Yeah, it's so generous to have people not have oh. to reinvent the wheel and the framework if it's tried and true. I'm actually really glad you said that because that was sort of a prerequisite of us working in here that it was gonna be viewed as social capital for Bellevue, something that they had access to and could reference at any time. So it's, that was kind of the point. Yeah, yeah. Now, how, I feel like everybody on this call now is invested in you getting your M, uh, MFA. End of month. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. And, and um, when will the research be published? It should be immediately after uh, it's defended. And that's, uh, probably the end of the month here. So um, probably available for public viewing as early as July. So okay. looking forward to it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's literally the last leg. I'm, I'm done aside from that. <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations. Thank you. And Thank um, you. definitely ping me when, when that happens and I, I'd be more than happy to share 
that with people who were on this call. And oh, we'd love to have it shared. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So feel free to reach out to us with any other questions. Happy to share our resources and insights. Yes. Yeah, um, and same with the creative placemaking. Uh, we would love to critique. We're not at all proud. <laughs> so we we're happy to take the feedback where we can get it. Um, and likewise, if you saw something in here that you think could help you guys, uh, let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I like the top mural the best. I mean, <laughs> apropos of nothing. <laughs> I'll tell Jenny. <laughs> the one with the houses. Yeah, I, I really like that too. It, it is heavily favored. Um, yeah, it does have a really nice color palette. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, and this is an actual building. So back to RJ's point of uh, people donating their uh, their properties. So that's that's one of the buildings a mural will be represented. So that is Belfield. Mm -hmm. In case it wasn't obvious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. And if people want to get in touch with you, where do they find you? So you can find us on practically all manner of social media, um, but generally you can go to pluspublic.org. Uh, you can contact us via email, pluspublicdesign at gmail.com. But generally go to our website, find our email, say hello. You see Messenger there in the bottom right-hand corner, ping us on there. Uh, and you can connect with us on LinkedIn too. We're always looking to expand our network, share resources, and most importantly, learn from all of you. Come bug us. Yep. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much um, for, for just sharing, sharing yourselves with us. Um, I look forward to hearing about the singing RJ. <laughs> oh, we're have it all over social media. <laughs> How many times are you going to have to do that? I'm wondering. <laughs> uh, probably at least 30 times. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know what you should do? You should pick a song that has a lot of verses, do a verse for every person, and then splice it all together. <laughs> cool. Hmm. Thanks, everyone. I got to go. Yeah. yeah, and um, just want to just want to say really quickly. Next week, uh, we're having the first of our series of six.